There we go. How's that? Uh, this is mucormycosis is an important disease because it frequently presents as a medical emergency. It's a, an acute infection, and there's a lot of inflammation, thrombosis, and it characteristically will invade the uh, arteries, and uh, it follows along uh, through the vascular system, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. This organism is all over. It's the, have you ever had fruit and something you left in the refrigerator and it gets white mold on it? Okay, those are usually one of these mucor species. They're all over. Again, like if I wipe my finger on here and put it on one of those sabroid dextrose agar plates, I'll grow out several species of these. Uh, people get them by inhalation, ingestion, and surface contamination. They're a big problem in burn patients. The burn lesion will get invaded with these. So they, in burn units, they go through quite a lot of procedures to keep uh, infection. That's one of the biggest problems in burn patients is infection because those burns heal by granulation. And uh, you got to, they make a beautiful medium for bacteria and fungi. There are three genera, by far rhizopus is the most common causing disease, and mucor species and obsidia. They occur worldwide, and they, their ecological niche is everywhere. Food, soil, any organic debris. Uh, and the biggest problem is the uncontrolled diabetic. And what typically you'll see is a patient, an uncontrolled diabetic, will come in and they'll probably be comatose. And the family will say, yeah, he has diabetes. Now, you look closely, you can probably see the white mold growing in their nose. And what you've got to do immediately, what's the first thing? You've got to treat the diabetes because that's why this thing is growing. And then, of course, uh, getting uh, cultures and identification to know what you're dealing with. But if you get any uncontrolled diabetic coming into the emergency room, uh, you better think of uh, mucormycosis. There'll be a ketoacidosis in the patient, nasal stuffiness, and that's from actual physical blockage of, uh, of uh, fungal elements. You know what proptosis is? The eyeballs kind of bulge out because there's a mass growing behind them. And eschar, they'll have bleeding around the nose and you'll see these scabs around the nose and in the mouth. Uh, it's amazing, they have this affinity for arterial invasion and they grow in. So what happens is uh, you inhale, the patient inhales it, gets it in the nose and it grows right up following the um, arteries and veins and grows right up through the cribriform plate and into the brain. Direct extension and they're rapidly fatal. This is a patient from MUSC and uh, he came in, I was about a 45 year old uh, black man. He had diabetes and he came in comatose. And you could see, see the uh, Escar here, here, and the eyes. You can even see that the eyes are bulging with the proptosis. Why does it? Because the question was, why does it affect diabetics? Because uh, with the ketoacidosis, they, they just form a beautiful milieu for the fungus to grow. And then as well as it, uh, uh, it's right next to the brain. You inhale it, and the fungus has the arterial uh, tendency to grow along arterial ways and goes right to the brain. Uh, and this doesn't show too well, but what it is, this is the skull is open. Do you do, you do autopsies anymore? No? 
Well, we always open the skull, and you cut it. This is the edge of the skull. And this is the brain reflected back, so you're looking into the two fossa. All this white stuff is pus. This is the same patient. And uh, this is the pus that grew up to the crib before plate. It's probably underneath here. And it grew up, and the fungus grew up in here. This is an example. Uh, I know the histology isn't great here, but because it's all distorted by uh, organism growth. But this is the arterial wall. See this? You see all the fungi, this dark purple, are the fungus growing in the arterial wall. These look round. Now, these are not yeast, but these are cross sections of mycelial filaments. This is only in a mycelial form. And you can see the branching here. And you can see they're wide and they're um, uh, ribbon like. They're often described as ribbon like. This is a better example. Wide, non septate, ribbon like branching. In the culture plate, they'll grow up in four or five days. They're fairly rapid. Uh, they are, some of them are dermatiaceous. You can see the pigment in the, um, in the mycelium form here. Again, wide, septate, branching, ribbon like. Now, these are the fruiting bodies, and we identified them by the fruiting bodies size, shape, color, uh, and, and the placement of uh, some of these uh, filaments, which I won't go into with you. Uh, but that's how we identify them to species. Uh, treatment. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, control the diabetes. Or if there's some other underlying disease that this patient has. But diabetes is the most common. Biopsy material to the lab. Culture material to the lab. And then surgery and debridement. And lastly, amphoterable. It's uh, still probably the drug of choice in this. Intravenous, rapidly acting, and you have the least uh, recurrence of disease with amphotericin B. We have a serological test, an immunodiffusion test. That works pretty well. Okay. Remember, diabetics and mucormycosis. Now, this is becoming, aspergillosis is becoming probably one of the biggest problems in infectious disease, particularly in hospitalized patients. It causes all kinds of diseases, pulmonary, external ear, eyes, meninges, sinus, or bloodstream. Uh, if you get a person with an ear infection, you go in with your otoscope and start to look into the ear, you'll see the fungus right, right there just growing out, a bunch of seaweed, and it'll probably be white or black. There are three primary types. The allergic type is uh, allergy, kids with asthma, and uh, sensitivities uh, to this uh, disease. The next is fungus ball. The fungus ball, I'll show you some pictures. You don't see too much now. It grows within a cavity, an old TB cavity, where the TB has been cured, and there's this empty cavity. You inhale the spores of aspergillus, and they start growing in there. And they grow like a colony, like on a plate, because there's air in that sac. And the third type, the big problem, is the invasive, where it grows through any tissues in the body, and it just penetrates through. The reason this is difficult to diagnose is because the symptoms are not specific. We'll talk about specific symptoms on the other diseases. The radiography is not specific unless it's a fungus ball, which is very specific. 
But usually the fungus ball is not a big clinical problem. The blood cultures are seldom positive. Blood culturing for fungi in general are not real good. They're good for Canada. You can get most of those. But in general, blood cultures are not great. Uh, serology is seldom positive early enough so that you know what you're dealing with. Uh, it takes a little while to become positive. And uh, you need invasive procedures for early detection. Bronchial or lavages and that sort of thing. Going on in and take a look. There are probably 900 species of this organism, and these are the three most common Aspergillus fumigatus, Aspergillus niger, and Aspergillus flavus. They occur worldwide, they're everywhere. They're in soil, decaying vegetation, they grow on foods, they grow on medications. They grow in air vents, and this was a big problem in the beginning of heart surgery. Uh, many patients were infected with this. That was before we had all these HEPA filters on um, uh, operating room air, and they would just come in through the air, particularly if there was any construction anywhere nearby. The air would have the organisms in it, and they'd get deposited into the patient. And they'll even grow in disinfectants. Uh, I said 900, it, and I don't know why I put 100 there, but uh, again, you got mycologists who are splitters and lumpers, so you'll get anywhere. You, there's a book for identifying these that's about this thick with uh, more than a thousand species uh, in there on how to detect them. But fortunately, the, the, just the three that are most common. They are very slow growing. They have various colors, the gross colony morphology, which helps to identify them. And then the spores, and they vary in size, shape, texture, and color. When I say they vary, I mean they vary. For each species, they're consistent. There's just so many different uh, types. But for each species, the size, shape, and these other characteristics are consistent with that species. This is an example. Here's mycelium. This is uh, not, uh, this is in culture. And this is the, they call it the aspergillus. And now this is not a good shot because if you had a good one or you're looking at it microscopically without playing around with it, without moving it, these chains of conidia will come way out like this. But in manipulating to make a slide, they, they break off. So that's why you only see short streams of conidia. Now this is an important point. Dichotomous branching. Uh, <clears throat> this is what dichotomous branching. You get two from one, two from one. Uh, and this is typical of Aspergillus. Almost all the species of Aspergillus will form this dichotomous branching. Uh, here's an example. You can see that branching there. Here it is. Here's some more branching. I don't know why I can't, you can't see that one hardly at all. Can you see it in the back? Anyway, that's, that's the uh, uh, a tissue section with dichotomous branching. Okay, I told you about a um, fungus ball. Again, you can, this tissue is so distorted you can't tell what it is. But this is lung, and this is the old abscess wall here. And this is the organism growing like as this in a culture. And you can see all the spores growing off the end of the tips. And that's called the aspergilloma. Radiologists today can just identify those right off. No, no problem. And they can even do it uh, by the various scans. And uh, uh, they have these formations. What, here's a close up. This is the aspergillus and these are spores. The um, uh, different uh, types of scans now, they can identify these. And the typically, I thought I had a figure of this, 
that there's a crescent shape in the fungus ball. You see the large abscess, and the fungus itself is along the edge of the wall in crescent shape. You know what a crescent moon is. And, and so radiologically, that's uh, easy to detect. There are two tests, mainly. The immunodiffusion test, uh, what did you call it when you lectured, Dr. Mayer? Did you call it octolone or precipitin or immunodiffusion test? Okay. Well, the immunodiffusion tests, we're going to talk about them with some of these other diseases. You put a drop of antigen here and a drop of unknown, and they migrate and they form bands. Now, this one, aspergillus, forms five bands, and in general, the number of bands will be consistent with the severity of the disease. A single allergy, you'll have maybe one or two diseases, uh, one or two bands, but in uh, invasive disease, you'll have five bands. So that's an important point. That test has been around for about 30 years now. The galactomannan test is an EIA procedure, and it's rather new, but it seems to be working, and they look for the galactomannan that's in the cell walls of the aspergillus. The drugs of choice are voriconazole, that's a, a fairly new antimycotic agent, and amphotericin B. Amphotericin B is the oldest, it's the most toxic, but it's still the most efficient. Okay, any questions?